public session. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep all of the members in the spotlight for the next item and give everyone a warm welcome to this special meeting of the Education Committee with the Education Minister. Agenda item one is apologies. Apologies have been received from William Humphrey, MLA, and Justin McNulty, MLA. Can I? I don't think we have any other apologies then. Every other member is here in attendance. Okay, then members have moved to agenda item two, which is our briefing from the Minister for Education on school restart and related issues. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight? and to add our witnesses. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the Department of Education that can be found at page three of table papers, a briefing note from the committee clerk at page five, the minister's oral statement to the ad hoc committee on COVID-19 and school restart is at page seven, Department of Education response to the committee's correspondence proposing a summer programme, page 14. Department of Education response regarding vaccination and testing is at page 17. Correspondence from a school principal regards coordination of sport in schools and club sport and correspondence querying the legal powers for new face mask requirements, face covering requirements at page 23. Also in table items is an added note from the same correspondence about face covering requirements and a response to the committee's questions regards digital poverty. Members content to note these items and you might want to refer to them in any uh, questions with the Minister. Agreed? Okay. Can I welcome then our Minister for Education, Peter Weir. Uh, Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing at the Department of Education. Karen McCulloch, Curriculum Qualifications and Standards Director at the Department of Education. James Hutchinson, Director of Education Restart at the Department of Education. And Peter Hutchinson, Head of the Independent Review Stroke Transformation Program at the Department of Education. You're all very welcome, folks. Uh, can I invite the Minister? Uh, to uh, take up to uh, 10 minutes. I think we've got time for, for opening remarks today, if, if that's uh, suitable for you, Minister. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I should say maybe at the outset as well, to give yourselves the maximum amount of time, I'm just going to make very, very brief remarks at the start and allow the rest of the time for questions. Uh, I should maybe assure the committee as well that in these COVID days, obviously, um, Chair, I know you made reference to the Executive Away Day, which was uh, uh, roughly a fortnight ago. That, uh, I suppose, is a little bit less exotic in these COVID days than um, would normally be the case. And I think the Away Day meant myself and other ministers didn't get beyond our respective um, uh, Zoom meeting on, uh, certainly in my case, from Rathgale House on it. So I, the committee can be rest assured there wasn't any public money on expensive hotels or uh, luxurious uh, resorts in terms of that, that Away Day, but it was useful uh, from a planning point of view. Uh, obviously, in terms of this has been a very significant week in terms of restart um, for education. Uh, there has been, the executive has operated on a phased approach, uh, one that um, started off, I suppose, uh, on the 8th of March with the resumption of uh, the preschool and uh, P1 uh, to P3. Uh, I, I should say as well, I mean, look, it's important also whenever we're talking about restart, obviously, to pay tribute. Uh, first of all, that, that education itself during this period has never ended. Uh, and there's been a lot of hard work being done by school principals, by teachers and staff and by parents and by young people themselves in terms of remote learning. And also the fact that in terms of delivery of, of education, that uh, the provision, for instance, of childcare, and indeed provision within our special schools has um, has continued. Uh, and I contribute to all those staff who have who provided those services uh, as well. But in terms of the, it's been undoubtedly the case that while uh, in terms of the, the broader um, delivery, particularly of remote learning during this, this term, I think there have been, as we indicated, I think to schools at the beginning of the academic year that they should prepare themselves and ready themselves for whatever potential interruptions happened 
uh, in terms of face-to-face -face, uh, learning and consequently um, that there needed to be on a consultative remote uh, of sorry of being ready for remote learning for whatever cohorts needed it um, that while I think that has been delivered in a manner which uh, because there was that level of preparation because it wasn't something unlike uh, a year ago which I think all of us felt fell into a unprecedented situation that the, the scale and uh, quality of remote learning I think has been of a much greater standard but nevertheless it's undoubtedly been the case uh, that for a range of reasons both academic and non-academic uh, that the best possible solution is for our young people to be directly um, in education in that face-to-face -face learning uh, and as I indicated I think on a number of occasions that's not as simply just in terms of the academic catch-up and indeed the quality of engagement that can happen on an educational basis within schools but also I think it's an important part for our young people in terms of their routine, in terms of their general well-being, in particular their mental health. Uh, the ability, uh, and it's maybe not been surprising, I think that every classroom that I've been in since the 8th of March, um, I've asked sort of pupils as to what they've, they've, what they felt most about, about getting back. And it is particularly that level of interaction with their friends, being able to see that direct contact. And they, some of them even admitted to missing their teachers which again wouldn't have been something probably all of us would have necessarily assumed a, a while ago. But uh, the first steps were obviously taken on the 8th of March. This week has been a very significant week because the already planned situation as regards the resumption uh, of years 12 to 14 um, was able to start again uh, yesterday. Uh, similarly, the executive agreed to uh, move away from, I think, what was a certain level of anomaly and ensure, therefore, that P1s to P3s uh, continued on and did not have to make way, if you like, for their older colleagues uh, in terms of, of that. Uh, and also we've seen the resumption this year, sorry, this week of Peace Force to Peace 7. So the primary schools are fully back with the intention subject to final review uh, probably next week uh, that we would see a full resumption within schools uh, from the 12th of April. Now, there are other issues which are still in the pipeline. Uh, I know a number of them we want to touch on. And I suppose from that point of view, without in terms of the process that the executive has adopted in terms of a broader task force, there are particular issues where submissions have been made from the department in terms of trying to get uh, moved towards resumption on issues such as Sure Start and uh, youth settings. And it's important that those elements are not forgotten about as, as well. But as yet, the executive is yet to bring those forward um, for discussion. But I would hope that there could be movement on those as well. So, look, I appreciate there's a myriad of issues that, that arise out of restart and indeed the wider wider position on it. So, uh, I, as I said, I'm keeping my remarks very brief in relation to that so that Chair, yourself and others uh, are in a position then to, to probe into the various areas that you want want to do in relation to those those issues. OK, thanks for those opening remarks, Minister. Uh, sorry, I realise... Uh, we don't have any ice cream cones to provide for our sweet for you today. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, so you had me a little bit of those yesterday. You've made a few uh, a few waves on national press for your ice cream eating skills, I believe, Minister. <laughs> well, to be, to be fair, it's, it's it's a good way. And look, to be fair, I think to a lot of the schools, I suppose, I know, I know it's a bit of, bit of humour, obviously, in, in relation to this. I think a number of the schools, to be fair, I think we're very keen to try to get, get uh, particularly children back in at primary school level, to get, um, if you like, particularly to make yesterday, and I think particularly this week, is a, a lot of it's about familiarisation. And I suppose we forget that at times that even amongst some of the, the primary school children, they've been out for 13 weeks directly. So, you know, I, I, think, see, I think it's good to see that a, a number of schools have actually um, provided that particular fun element. And um, members will be relieved to hear that, although I was very keen to eat the ice cream, I, I think uh, I might have, if I had, the bouncy castles, which were available also at the same, the same school. That had I done those, I think may might have created a level of permanent damage to those on it. So I resisted any temptation to be on a bouncy castle. Wise, wise, wise choice, Minister. <laughs> um, Minister, as you say, obviously um, extremely welcome that we have reached the the milestone of uh, many pupils being able to return to to school. Uh, it's been an extremely difficult time uh, for them. But can you update the committee on the, the the prevailing scientific and medical advice and circumstances that permitted that return to school for uh, many year groups? 
Well, look, I, I think there's a, there's a number of things. And the process by which this is, has happened has been that, um, as now I think with all aspects of the, the executive has, has adopted a sort of a broader pathway um, strategy, which then has across a range of sectors, a level of, of phasing. The position is that where there is then any set of proposals to move forward in any direction within that pathway, that departments will then submit papers to the, the task force group within the executive office. They will take then very much um, their indications out of this from the um, from the medical advice, particularly from CMO and uh, I suppose Deputy CSA and the Department of Health. So we submitted that. The uh, CMO and CSA then analysed those. Uh, they indicated that uh, much of this was already happening, but I suppose made specific list of mitigations that they felt were important to be put in place for return to school, which we were happy to accept. And as such, I suppose they, they endorsed then those proposals. The position, I suppose, in terms of the medical and scientific advice has been that, largely speaking, schools themselves, particularly with the mitigations, are a very safe place. The concern, I suppose, was always around um, what the broader behavioural impact of a return to schools, or indeed where schools were sitting, and what impact that would have on the, the R rate. To that extent, I suppose, any form of relaxation that the that the executive of the whole makes in any direction will have some level of, of impact uh, on that, but I suppose I would make two points. First of all, the executive as a whole has agreed to prioritise that that return. So if, if we are taking slow steps forward, that education is in the um, is at the forefront of that. But also, I suppose with the advantage now that we've seen with both the extent of the vaccination in Northern Ireland and also the um, uh, the level of of useful impact of the, the vaccination in terms of the growing medical evidence within that. The R rate itself will have a level of significance, but I suppose the R rate itself is only really a measure, largely speaking, to actually what really matters, which is what is the level of hospitalisation, what is the level of deaths. So even where there will be a level of community transfer, um, the impact as we move ahead with the, the vaccine should hopefully mean that the, the level of, of health impact at any one stage of the virus will also be reduced. Okay, and you mentioned mitigations. Um, I to be honest, I have observed and received some concern, concerns in relation to some of the, the imagery from School Restart this week with in, in regards to social distancing, for example. So can, can you say something about the current safety guidance and measures that are in place in terms of social distancing, in terms of face covering, ventilation, some of those measures that we know would go a long way to enhancing uh, safety uh, in the school restart? Yeah. We got, um, I suppose, particularly two pages worth of mitigations that were suggested by uh, Department of Health. There would be, I think, some of those that will be related to what directly they can do. Uh, there's a range of mitigations. Uh, I think the most obvious one being that for post-primary uh, students, then that that uh, that there will be face coverings be worn in class, as opposed to simply moving in communal areas, and that has been implemented by schools. There is also a process, I'm sure we'll get into this as well, of um, lateral flow tests, which will hopefully identify at an early stage where there are asymptomatic cases and will mean then that, that in terms of that level of mixing that's there, where schools can use space, they're encouraged to do so. I think the, probably the, the issue in terms of social distancing is there is a level of constraint realistically on that, which is if, if, if ultimately, and particularly post-Easter, we will have roughly about a third of a million children uh, in school, there is a limitation on what I suppose, ultimately can be done with social distancing. And that's not simply the issue of physical space, but if we were to spread all those children out um, in a much wider way, it's actually also about what can actually be provided in terms of in terms of teaching. There's a range of other measures have also been put in place. So uh, working with the EA and uh, TransLink, for instance, um, they are implementing uh, greater levels of checks on, on buses because Again, one of the things that has been said is it's not directly so much at times what happens within the school gates themselves, but beyond that in terms of some of the levels of mixing. Um, and also we're trying to send out a strong message, particularly to parents with physical signage around schools, indicating that, that they should be wearing face coverings, creating social distancing where they can on the drop off and, and, and pick up. Uh, and also we're working with PHA as to uh, trying to ensure, and I think a lot of this will, will ultimately have to be driven from within the schools themselves, um, of 
ensuring that there is um, enforcement of what's there, that there is compliance with what is being being asked for. I think those are the main okay. Uh, areas. Okay, and what is the current guidance for clinically extremely vulnerable pupils or pupils with a clinically extremely vulnerable family member in their household? I, I think that, that from the PHA side of it is they will give direct advice to those particularly small number of individuals where they are advised not to come for school and there would be then a uh, provision then made for continuation of, of remote learning. That that has largely been the case. It is largely been, as I understand with that, that, that the health advice has pretty much been on a very restricted number of individuals uh, on that basis, but those provisions are, are being made and we will follow directly any advice and those individuals and families will follow those, that advice where it comes purely from, from health there, the, the people who are the experts on that. In the same way, I suppose they have given advice in the broader level um, uh, within adult settings in terms of where there are clinically extremely vulnerable adults in terms of what they can do in terms of work. Don't Ricky, is that you wanted to add to that? No, that's that's right. Okay. Okay. I think that's but maybe something a bit more clarity is needed on that, Minister, but we can come back to that times obviously moving on. What what is the current extent of the testing capacity in our schools? Well, the lateral flow this week, I suppose, is largely going to be a familiarization test. We've worked closely with PHS to the way forward in connection with this. So what has been rolled out, I think um, I think it was Friday week ago, the EA received its first batch of, I think possibly that is, it would be about 700,000, was it, or what was the, the figure? I can't remember the, the exact figure in terms of lateral flow tests. Uh, the aim is to target that in um, initially on pupils who are in years 12 to 14. Uh, I think the feeling from the point of view of testing, it is less significant where it would be used, for instance, in primary school settings. So it is to target that and also particularly staff within uh, within the, the post-primary sector, and then the, working with PHA to roll that further as we move beyond beyond Easter, particularly as regards staff. What has tended to be the case, I think, from a PHA point of view, is that there has been, uh, generally speaking, levels of transmittability between pupils and levels of transmittability between staff. The, the, the incidents where there is any level of transmission between staff and pupils or vice versa has been extremely limited within the system. That, that's what we find in connection with that. This week, I think, having worked uh, last week, particularly with trade union side as well, um, this is, I suppose, effectively a certain level of trial week within post-primaries. And the aim would be that, that uh, they can use those initial tests and do a test within the school, or the school has been given permission, given a level of optionality to enable that they can do demonstrations within the school, and that is either physically or alternatively by way of showing video presentations. So I know, for instance, post -prim the post-primary I was in yesterday have arranged to think this, I think it's tomorrow afternoon, where they have uh, like a school nurse in who will be given the demonstrations uh, within that. And then the aim would be over the Easter period and beyond for uh, that those lateral flow tests to be done by pupils and indeed by staff as well at home. So it's not done directly within the, the school situation. Okay. And how many special school staff have been vaccinated? Well, letters of letters went out in terms of the ability for them to um, book online for around about just short of 700, I think. Yes, that's right. So two uh, Ricky, Ricky will bring you in just a little detail. Just another shot. Thanks, Minister. So two weeks ago, Chair, booking instructions were issued to all the eligible staff that had been um, identified by the schools who support the clinically extremely vulnerable children that had been identified by the trusts. They also received letters that week uh, to take with them to the vaccination centres. So as the Minister says, there were just under 700 staff uh, identified uh, in two cohorts. So um, I expect most of them will probably have either received their first vaccination now or certainly have their dates. And that would be obviously in addition to anybody that would be making just their own, well, when I say their own arrangements, obviously we're now in a situation with the vaccine uh, that it has been made available to anybody. Various cohorts have been identified, but anybody, largely speaking, over the age of 50, which uh, to the passage of time I fall into in that regard, um, is has been able to then to, to make bookings themselves on it. So there would obviously be, in addition to those 700 other staff who would fall into the on the age category side of it as well. Yeah. Okay, I presume other members might come in on that as well, but 700 out of approximately 4,000 staff, I think, is... Uh, to, be, 
no more the, than twenty percent. Um, the, the, there wouldn't be, uh, chair. There wouldn't be quite that number of staff. I think it's around about is it three thousand two hundred. Yeah, so it's probably about a quarter of teaching and non-teaching staff, chair, uh, okay. which is around two thousand six hundred. But just to emphasise the point that this really has been a health-led process. We were relying on the trusts and the uh, consultant paediatricians to identify the lists of clinically extremely vulnerable children uh, and then the schools identified the groups of staff mm -hmm. that support those children. So um, while it's around 10% of the school population for special schools, it is probably around 20% uh, or so, or in fact, maybe 25% of the teaching and non-teaching staff. So. Um, it reflects that there's uh, multiple staff that support each of those children. I think it's also like it's also worth re-emphasising that from a, both my own point of view and the department's point of view, our ideal situation would have been that, that all special school staff would have been vaccinated, but obviously the wider decision was taken to reach consensus with health who weren't supportive of all staff. They, they felt actually that that would move outside JCVI guidelines. So we've had a lengthy period of, of work with health to, to reach this this position yeah. but at least there's been a level of, i think of progress uh within that albeit it's, it's not probably the ideal situation which any of us would have liked to have reached i may have lost the chair is the deputy chair there just now pat Okay, yeah. so that's the spotlight. Thank right. you, Pat. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I'll carry on until the chair arrives back again. I was next in line to ask questions anyway, so uh, push on. And for, first of all, I have two kids in the primary sector, so um, the, the first one had been back a couple of weeks, and the older one, who's in P5, went back yesterday. So I have two very happy children. Uh, not as happy as their mother, who was <laughs> for most of their home learning. Uh, so uh, all, all around, everybody's well pleased. However, I mean, I still have some concerns. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that the, the phased return was changed. I mean, the original uh, idea was that as each cohort returned, it would be assessed after... Uh, a certain period of time to see if it had any impact on community transmission. And the decision has been taken now that we will look at evidence from other jurisdictions, such as, as Scotland, the South, and, and, and so on. Now, there are some concerns being raised. First of all, that transmission rates among children are rising in Scotland. And there, I saw some reports yesterday from the South that the number of children between four and 16 uh, who have contracted the virus ha ha has also increased. Um, I know there was a crash closed down in I think it was County Leash or County Offaly. And uh, I, I've heard reports from some locals that a school in County Leitrim had to close because they couldn't cope with the number of infections there. And I suppose, what I'm, what I'm saying is that, and I suppose given the news this morning where Boris Johnston said that the, the raising infection rate on the continent was at some stage going to impact on the UK, uh, and uh, presumably that will also impact on Ireland. So, I mean, what contingency plans do you have in place, Minister, if the infections rate uh, the, the infection rates do rise again? Well, look, I think there's a couple of things in relation to that, Pat. Uh, look, in Northern Ireland, we took a slightly more cautious approach than was happening elsewhere. So, for example, um, the position in terms of both the qualification years, I know that some people, for instance, will be critical of the situation in England where everybody went back really from the 8th of March and there was a pure prioritisation of education as one, as one lump. But we did actually, in terms of the other actions that were taken, comparing with Scotland, Wales and the Republic of Ireland, um, where again, probably the, the levels of transmittability is very similar. Um, all went back in terms of their full primary school cohort. 
and the qualification years a, a, a week earlier. What I would say in terms of contingency plans, schools have been consistently told to be on the basis to have um, remote learning ready to be activated as we give them indications really at the beginning of the academic year. Because irrespective of the wider picture, there can always be situations where within a particular classroom, within a school, you will see some levels of um, transmittability. And so consequently, you know, will this be 100% for everybody all the time? No, I don't think that's, that's likely to be the case. But in terms of, I suppose, uh, I suppose there are a couple of issues in terms of the um, mention that's been made about the, the levels of rate. I, I suppose the point is it's, it's, it's not purely the levels that are within the community that will be of critical um, impact. It is also be the, the, will be the changing pattern of what level of impact that will have on um, hospitalisation, for instance. And as the vaccine rolls out, um, what it is meaning is that, that, first of all, that the cohorts that will, that will have COVID will more and more be concentrated on those who are least at risk in terms of impact. And indeed, I know some of the studies, for instance, the United States have indicated that some of the vaccines will have a particular impact in terms of whether you get the thing, but also have beyond that an impact in terms of hospitalisation. And also compared um, with the Republic of Ireland or indeed mainstream mainland Europe, I suppose one of the advantages that we have throughout all the parts of the United Kingdom is that we've reached a point at which there is a uh, there's still quite a high level of vaccina vaccination compared to other jurisdictions. Uh, I think in terms of uh, the number of vaccines that have been distributed within Northern Ireland, I think roughly speaking, today's figure is somewhere in the region of about 750,000 with around about maybe about 70,000 or 60 or 70,000 of those being um, big second vaccinations. So, um, yeah, and the, the rollout of the vaccination has been very welcome. Although yeah. we have to bear in mind, one, that children aren't being vaccinated, and two, there uh, is some research showing that the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine in particular is not effective against the South African variant of the virus. So so there are some concerns, and, and I don't want to be too negative about this or, 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 or paint too black a picture, but if there are disruptions and... I think we have to assume that there are going to be further disruptions. One, one, of, one of the issues I want to raise is the issue of the transfer test uh, and how children are going to be affected by that uh, if, if there is disruptions. And I asked you during the Ad Hoc Committee this week to congratulate St Mary's on the decision they had taken in the interest of children and the unprecedented uh, um emotional stresses that they have faced as a result of this pandemic and you didn't do so and today we see another report out from the Ulster University saying that these transfer tests and academic selection are traumatizing children and, and, and some are even being traumatized in the adulthood and, and I know that you believe uh, some children benefit from the process of academic selection. And uh, I, I think that at some stage, and particularly in the context in which we are currently living, that you have to make an assessment that whatever benefits you may think there are, they are being vastly outweighed by the damage that's being done to children. And I would ask you again to reconsider uh, well, well, first of all, I'm not going to ask you. I'm not. I'm not going to ask you to reconsider your position uh, forever in regard to academic selection. But certainly, while this current health emergency continues, and the the mental health of our children is being affected and being added to by the stress of the uh, and the uncertainty of not knowing whether they're going to be doing or not going to be doing uh, transfer tests. Oh, okay, Pat. Look. It does strike me that um, the difference of opinion on academic selection and transfer tests is probably likely to outlast um, the virus for however long that, that goes. So I don't think we're going to reach a consensus on that. Schools are entitled, uh, and a number of schools, for instance, will not use academic selection and some will. Legally, there is a right for schools to be able to use academic selection, and I will defend that right. What I would say is... and. 
look, it is likely there has not been a consensus on this issue for probably in excess of 50 years in different um, jurisdictions in that, in that regard. And if we are talking about the level of impact on particular children, the fact that for some children who want to go to particular schools, uh, that without a some form of academic selection, they are, we will have no opportunity whatsoever. That, that really, and indeed what has been probably driven by a number of schools given the circumstances of this year, is in many ways selection on the basis of certain levels of accident at birth, certainly a range of things to which um, particularly those individuals have no uh, control over whatsoever. You know, it is not a route which I'm, I'm going down, and I think, um, I think you can press the issue, certainly, and you're perfectly entitled to, to do so. I, I, I would be um, misleading you to think that there will be a meeting of minds, I suspect, on this issue, uh, Pat, between yourself and me, and I think that that is something that's likely to continue for uh, the foreseeable future in that regard. I agree, I agree with that, Peter, but, but I'm asking you to suspend your views while this pandemic continues. Uh, and, and that's the issue. But, with, but with respect, Pat, first of all, I, I would make a couple of points. First of all, legally, there's a right um, to do that. Legally, I do not, even, even if I was suddenly convinced of the merits of doing that, I do not legally have the power to prevent schools using academic selection. And I also believe that uh, for... Uh, many children, this will actually be denying them levels of choice and denying their families levels of choice, which otherwise would exist. So it's not a route I'm going to go down. OK, uh, but I mean, surely you can't ignore a report that says children are being traumatised. And, 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 and I leave it at that. I want, I want to ask you a uh, final question, if the chair will indulge me. Just and we had a and we, we had a short exchange at the adjournment debate there uh, a week or so ago uh, uh, about the how uh, children and young people have been uh, adversely affected in terms of their mental health and well-being as a result of this pandemic. Uh, and I know, and uh, you know, I, I acknowledge the emotional and well-being education framework that's there. Uh, I have a view. Uh, and I think it's shared by many people in the mental health sector that it's not sufficient to deal with the tsunami that's coming at us. And I acknowledge also you've had discussions with the health minister and the mental health champion, Professor Siobhan O'Neill. Uh, and I suppose what I'm interested in is, have you any plans to uh, you know, bring forward a much more expansive programme to deal with the problems that may uh, may be there, and and have you made any bids to the finance minister uh, to resource those uh, plans? Thanks. thanks yeah, Pat. I mean, look, there's, 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 thanks, Pat, and I think it may be an area where we would have greater commonality in, in that regard. Yeah, look, there are two aspects, as you indicated, uh, the rollout of the emotional health and well-being framework with the funding for it, uh, mainly through education, but in part through some funding through health is mainstream the baseline within budgets that would have probably been launched a little bit sooner were it not for COVID. And that will be something that will be ongoing year on year. But it's undoubtedly also the case that uh, there is a need for uh, a level of uh, support specifically, I suppose, arising out of out of COVID. There is a, a amount of funding that the executive has available in terms of COVID um, funding for uh, 21-22. Um, the experience of this year has been that that fund, wherever it starts, quite often grows over time. So there is a, a bid that is part of that. Um, the finance minister is to decide, and the executive of the whole is to decide, probably within the next few days, what the initial levels of funding uh, of both the wider budget for next year and the initial tranche of, of, of COVID. So yes, there is a bid uh, within that, but we are dependent upon receiving that additional funding from uh you know, from the executive as a whole as part of the, the COVID situation. But there may be opportunities as well, irrespective of where we reach on day one, if I can put it that way. Uh, the experience of what happened this year in terms of COVID funding was there's a certain amount, we're getting, I suppose, national funding. That has tended to grow over time. Last year, I suppose, just by way of a little bit of a caveat on that, 
last year there was uh, about or sorry this financial year about three billion was made available to the executive through COVID funding unfortunately some of that was quite late in the day um, the current figure I think is around about 900 million for next year so there is considerably less available but I think it's important that there is that support for our young people in terms of in terms of mental health. Thanks Pat, thanks Minister. Uh, Minister, just before my internet failed me, um, yeah. I was completing questioning on uh, special school staff vaccination. Can I ask you yeah. quickly, is a quarter of special school staff uh, being eligible for vaccination good enough? And do you accept that there are many special school staff who feel uh, failed and let down by their exclusion from this vaccination programme? Well, look, from that point of view, Chair, I want to see every special school staff member vaccinated. That was not the decision. Health indicated that they were opposed to that on the grounds that they did not believe the vaccination should be ruled out on the basis of it being profession-led as opposed to age-led in that regard. The executive then took a view and there was not, you know, if I was sitting there with a the majority in the executive to be certain simply to get through my proposals, I'd have pushed them to vote in connection with that. But there wasn't a consensus in the executive simply to go ahead with every special school staff member getting vaccinated. The decision instead was the consensus had to be reached with the Department of Health. So we've taken it as far as we can. Would I prefer it if I was given a completely blank sheet to go further? Yes, but it's not, I, I don't have a, I don't have a single vaccine in that in that regard on it, and I understand the frustration that's there from special school staff in okay. that regard. Could could the case have been made to the executive that the principles that were in place for the vaccination of the first group being the limitation of mortality and the the maintenance of the health service could could the case have been made to the executive that vital health services and health service provision are facilitated in our special schools and that a greater rollout should have been on those grounds well, rather the case, than the, the profession-based approach that has caused well, problems. No, the, the, case, the, case, the case was made. I suppose like, it's not for me to speak on behalf of health, but I suspect where they essentially came from was on the basis of they look at, um, shall we say, for every thousand vaccines issued to particular groups of people, what is the impact in terms of mortality and what they indicated was that the levels of mortality in terms of from an age base clearly outweighed any other particular considerations on, on that regard. And that, to be fair, is not simply a Northern Ireland position, but one that's been taken by JCVI. Okay. Uh, as, you know, but it's probably something okay. you need to maybe directly take to help. Okay. Them. I would love to ask you about post-primary transfer, GTC <laughs> and flexible school starting age, but I'll see if I've got time at the end and I'll bring in my colleagues. Uh, Robin Newton, MLA. Robin, you might be muted. Right. That's you, um, thanks. I think I'm on. Yep, yeah, okay. Thank nice you, job. and uh, thank you to the Minister uh, and his team for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Minister, I'd like maybe to pick up on, uh, first of all, a question uh, that I ask you uh, in the Chamber, uh, I think during one question time, around the ENGAGE programme, when you indicated that the feedback on the first year of the programme uh, had indeed been uh, extremely positive and that you wanted to provide schools with greater flexibility and the need to deal with a range of issues. Um, first of all, can I ask, Minister, um, what is the prospect for an extension of the ENGAGE programme, uh, and indeed not just within mainstream schools, uh, the potential of it uh, going in, even towards uh, other layers of our education system. Okay, Robin, in relation to that, that's part of the bid that's, that's there. I suppose there are, I suppose taking a couple of aspects to that. So I think part of the bid uh, in terms of COVID funding will relate to completion of the academic year because I suppose where there's a slight disjoint is that the school year runs effectively from September to June. The financial year, in terms of any funding that it's got, is April to the end of March. So there's an element of the bid that, that's in 
uh, which relates to the completion of the academic year. Uh, secondly, uh, then there is a second bid, which is in uh, leaving aside what can be done during the summer. There's a second bid in terms of Engage, which will run for September. That will be dependent upon what is there um, available to the executive and what they prioritise. Uh, I suppose one of the issues with that uh, may be, um, and again, this will be dependent upon where Department of Finance and the executive take a view, uh, that where they are in a position to fund things that can start at the beginning of the financial year, those may be immediately prioritised. Whether we then get uh, an immediate green light on some other stuff may be dependent upon whether they can do that at the start or whether they look to do that. I think the sooner we get certainty over that, the better. And that would expect that level of funding would also then extend to special schools, uh, to AOTAS, other settings of, of, of that nature as well. That would be the intent. But it's dependent upon getting that financial backup. Whether that happens in one tranche or we have to go back it remains to be seen. Chair, can just for the sake of clarity, can I ask when you might be making that bid to the executive and bids are, bids are in. Robin, the position essentially is the finance minister understandably is looking to finalise next year's budget as regards the main uh, call it the main part of the budget as well. But we are aware of a large, uh, a reasonable proportion of money that is available through COVID. That is kind of separate to the the normal bidding process. I think the idea for uh, the vast majority, at least, of that, that money to be allocated so it can start rolling out from the beginning of the financial year as well. But that, that is also, I, I suspect the two decisions probably will get taken together and probably within a relatively short space of time. But it, it lies with the Department of Finance and the executive as a whole rather than myself. So th those bids were sought. Basically, I, I think the position was without revealing too many secrets. I think a couple of weeks ago, um, departments at relatively short notice were... Uh, because I think some of this money had arrived in relatively late in to the executive. Department of Finance sought um, essentially bid a fairly quick turnaround of what they saw as their COVID um, requirements, requests, needs, whatever you want to put it for 21-22. So indicative figures on a range of things were sent by each department. Uh, so that's being considered separately to the overall um, sort of mainstream budget that would be there for next year. Okay, thank you, Chair. Can I pick up on the, uh, some of the points that the deputy was making in terms of the uh, emotional health and well-being of uh, of our pupils and, and indeed our, our young people? Um, we, we we do stress uh, and quite rightly, you know, stress the importance uh, to promote emotional health and well-being. Um, can I just ask, Minister? Are there any indications in, indeed that the staff working with the pupils also need support? Uh, and indeed, are we making any arrangements for the care and well-being of staff in, in these conditions? Well, we, we, we have given Robin in relation to that. Yes, there will be, I'm sure, stresses that, that will have, have taken place. Now, I think for both children and staff, a lot of them have shown a high level of resilience, and I want to commend them for that. But it's one of the reasons why, whenever we looked at the additional COVID money we have given uh, in this year's budget, and also hopefully if we gain money for next year, a high level of flexibility. And that can also mean that, that there's an opportunities for that some of that money within schools also then to be used to provide support for staff uh, as well. We want to put as little barriers as possible to uh, the spend of that money. I think it's also the case, as indicated, if we reach a point at which both the engaged side of things and the mental health and well-being are both funded, that there can be, where that drills down at the schools, there can be a level of fluidity of spend between that, because we appreciate, depending upon school, depending upon environment, the needs of individual schools and needs of individual groups will not always be the same. And we want to give the greatest level of opportunity for, on that COVID recovery side of it, for decisions to be taken at the, the grassroots level. So uh, where the two going to? So again, yesterday at one of the schools I was at had two vice principals, one dealing with uh, the sort of curricular academic side of it and the other dealing with the, the pastoral side. And I think there's, there's a level of interaction and interplay between the two. And there could be shifts in emphasis within that. And there's probably a good argument that academic catch up because of 
a lot of the good work has been done from remote learning may be easier than in some cases the uh, the broader sort of well-being damage that's been done to some young people and staff as well. Okay, can I? Uh, well, I mean, that, that I think is is that that flexibility is there is uh, I think a very sane and sensible approach. Uh, I, I do think that um, I have no evidence of this, but I feel fairly certain that. Uh, uh, teachers working at the front line and all the change and uh, stress that has been placed on them and how they have stepped up to the plate um, will indeed, uh, what may, uh, create some emotional health and well-being problems for the staff themselves. Can I ask, Minister, just a, as a, a final question then, in terms of the, the need for support from the finance minister and, and if there is a successful scheme that goes into goes into the summer months. Um, is there support there from the health uh, professionals and indeed from the communities uh, department in the possible extension of the school summer year, albeit in maybe non-academic approach to things? Well, look, I think it will have to be multi-agency. I suppose I don't want to create some level of, of maybe misinformation I suppose what we're looking at is, is I suppose, three tranches. So there will, what will happen in terms of the, call it the summer term from April to June. There is also then, again, depending upon funding, getting a sort of a engaged to from September. We would look to see what can be done also in seeking finance for summer schemes, which would be part academic, part, um, uh, part sort of collaborative in terms of um, some of the, the well-being, some of the physical side of things um, as well. Uh, those summer schemes would, would probably run, and we've sought expressions of interest from schools, and at this stage about 300 schools have expressed a level of interest in being involved in those. And those would run, some would say, we can do this for one week, we can do it for two weeks, we can do it for three weeks. That would be on the basis of schools volunteering, so it wouldn't be the term being extended as such, but schools being, being paid to provide that additional level of intervention. And in doing so, they can use drawdown either from willing staff members themselves to provide additional finance on that basis or alternatively by way of substitute teachers and that, that sort of thing on it. So it's not about it being imposed on anybody and it would be voluntary, both from the point of view of the individual pupils and also the individual schools on it. So I, I don't want to create an impression that it would be an extension, if you like, of the into the summer term, because I also think, to be fair for both a lot of children, for a lot of staff members as well, they very understandably will also want to have uh, a period of, of, of downtime during summer. And I think that that's important as well, so that people can hit the ground running when it comes to September. Just on that point, you made sure about the substitute teachers, um, or, sorry, Minister, substitute teachers. Uh, at what stage then might schools be going out to look for the recruitment of substitute teachers? Do you mean for the summer period? On yes. That um, well, look, from that point of view, I think it would be once we get, if we get a situation where there is agreement from the executive for funding uh, for that, then we can move ahead um, with with that on that, that basis. But clearly, um, we wouldn't be asking schools to look for anything un until we actually know that there's direct funding. And I yeah. suppose one of the slight concerns is that as, as sometimes nationally in terms of money seeping down in terms of COVID, um, sometimes that's been on a bit of a phased approach. So I, I think the sooner that we get at least clarity on that basis, and hopefully the, if we were getting a green light, that there wouldn't be too short a time frame between getting that green light and being able to activate those those actions. Okay. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Robert. I Thank you, Chair. There's a lot of positivity in there. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Minister. Uh, very good to see you uh, and your team as well. Um, the line's quite good today. I haven't been cut off once, Chair, so that's a positive to the team there. Go ahead. Minister, uh, like, like many other MLAs, we've been contacted by parents and pupils who report uh, significant confusion uh, around the requirements for evidence to enable our young people to be awarded grades in their GCSE, AS, and A levels. 
Uh, on the one hand, you and Sia uh, on, on a video I've seen have been saying that there's no requirement the pupils will be will take multiple tests in their subjects on the return to school, rather that we would like to see schools use evidence of candidates' performance from any point during one or the two years of study that have been undertaken. Similarly, Minister, you state that work completed at home can, unquote, contribute towards the evidence considered by teachers, end of quote. But your guidance is driving, the guidance that's actually been issued is driving schools to use multiple tests known by SIA as assessment resources. Uh, under the SIA, uh, under what SIA describes as high control conditions, you've seen the, the table, Minister. So SIA also steers schools towards using evidence generated recently, whatever that means. Uh, this all adds up to a strong uh, preference by yourself as Minister uh, and SIA for recently taken exams. So th this is adding considerable confusion and pressure and putting pressure on principals as well who, are, who feel that they're left with very little option but to go down the exam route, otherwise they'd be open to uh, appeals. So Minister, with that said, uh, will you now accept that this is a, a reality, that, that many schools are opting uh, for the exam uh, process uh, because they feel they have little choice? And further, uh, will you respond to the call that I made to you immediately after SIA released the guidance to schools about grades uh, awards and advise this guidance to <coughs> and advise revise this guidance to prevent the tsunami of exams uh, or young people, especially those doing GCSEs, will have. And I'm particularly concerned, and I know you'll share these concerns, Minister, uh, for, for GCSE students who will be absolutely swamped uh, and are reporting such at present. But, Daniel, from that point of view, I think the position is very clear. And both SIA and myself have made it clear that assessment tools can be used. SIA have indicated to schools that, that they don't believe that, that where they're being used that there's really, well, first of all, there is no requirement on them to do that. It is something which they can use. They've also indicated that what they believe that in terms of um, uh, the assessment tools that, that really shouldn't be any more than perhaps one per subject uh, matter, uh, that has been made very clear. It's been made clear on social media. It's been clear in the guidance. Part of the reason, I suppose, in terms of the issue of trying to use stuff that is more recent in its nature. There's a wide spectrum of advice, of information that can be used and evidence can be used. In many ways, quite often, the more recent stuff is also to try to provide the maximum opportunity for some students because it tends to be with most subjects um, that uh, in a lot of cases where a student will get a better knowledge of things the longer they actually are doing a subject, uh, the more proficient they will, they will get at it. So it's quite often judging somebody where they are today compared with say six months ago will tend to actually show a level of, of improvement uh, within that so it's it's not unreasonable that that more recent evidence is is uh, something which may be to the benefit of of pupils but we, we have made it very clear that first of all there's no compunction on schools to use the assessment tools it is uh to yeah. use sort of a golfing analogy it's, it's one tool in the bag and also that it shouldn't be overused now, that that has been made that has been made abundantly, abundantly clear. I uh, thank you for your clarification, that minister. But the, the the difficulty we're having, and I'm sure all the MLAs and members of this committee in particular are hearing this, that school principals feel that they like how, how can they have strong enough evidence to to withstand an appeal uh, without using this form of assessment? You know, well, so I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate your clarification. But the guidance is steering the ship in an entirely different direction and making it very difficult. Uh, for principals and for schools, and in particular for young people as a consequence? I, I, I don't think so, Daniel, to be honest. <coughs> I would respectfully disagree in relation to that. Look, we do need, and this is where the balance is to be struck, that we don't create too much of an onerous burden, but there's also got to be, that if we're talking about major qualifications, there's got to be a robust evidence-based quality to it as well. That is, I think, a similar approach that's being taken in other jurisdictions, because also we want to make sure that none of our young people are in any way disadvantaged compared to their compatriots in different jurisdictions. And also given the fact that uh, that in Northern Ireland, there is, if you like, a direction can be given uh, to SIA, but we don't have control over um, in terms of the way that it's carried out from um, other exam boards from outside Northern Ireland. There's got to be a level playing field for all our students, irrespective of what exam they're, they're, they're doing. So look, I think there is um, uh, there is no need for schools to be 
overly sort of uh, using assessment tools to the extent of, of overburdening. I mean, let's let's remember that from that point of view, those years 12 to 14, and there is still, if, if people are feeling that, that their ship is going in the wrong direction, given the fact that they've only been back since yesterday, there is opportunities for, for schools then if they feel that they've gone too far to roll back a little bit on that. And I think it's about having that level of evidence. It doesn't need to be one that is, is overly burdensome in terms of that. But there's no doubt that the, you know, there will need to be a level of evidence that, that will be gathered. There's no perfect um, solution that we can just do that sort of in a very light touch manner. Yeah. Well, th 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 thanks for your clarification of, of that. The, the difficult, I, know, I appreciate you saying that there's no need for this to happen, uh, nor necessarily uh, does it, should it. But the reality is that some principals that I've spoken to have no choice, that this is the only option left to them to avoid an appeal uh, because they need to provide the strongest possible evidence to substantiate the grade, if you like. But, but as I appreciate what you've said, that clarifies it. Uh, and I, I know that you'll appreciate that we have a duty of care to the young people that are at the centre of this and we need to protect them at all costs, particularly those at GCSE level, level who will be swamped with assessments if this was indeed the, the chartered path. But... Moving on, Minister, not only are young people concerned about the volume of work coming at them, but uh, principals are increasingly expressing extreme dissatisf dissatisf dissatisfaction with the much higher than expected levels of administrative accountability in respect of centre-determined grades. So uh, we've touched on this briefly. Minister, are you satisfied that the two days cover that has been offered is sufficient? Well, look, Daniel, I, I think what we wanted, we, we believe that that is the right balance within things. Uh, we believe that that gives a, a level of, of information. Look, I think we're all operating because of the circumstances and because of the fact there's only been a return uh, now in what are very tight time frames on that, on that basis. We need to actually ensure that there is a delivery of that. And, you know, the opportunity to have... Um, a much longer period. Simply, the timetable wouldn't wouldn't allow that. But we believe that that is something uh, which can largely be driven and think is successful. Karen, I don't know if there's you want to come yeah, in just directly. Just to make you aware that myself and Justin did meet with NITC um, to discuss the issue, and they did raise the the points about the administration around the candidate assessment form, and the revised guidance has addressed that issue. You know. They don't have to have a form for every pupil that is um, for which they're submitting a grade. So we said we'd get that issued, clarify the position with the key facts documents that I think maybe has been shared with you and with the a letter to the principals and through the uh, frequently asked questions and then see does, does that offer the clarification um, that was required, you know, that there wasn't as much administration as it as originally interpreted from the guidance. Yeah, there, there's different. Thank you for that. There's there's different different differing opinions uh, in relation to this. Uh, what I'm hearing by a much larger scale is that that, that, that principals feel swamped uh, by the level of uh, administration uh, required. Um, the the two day cover has come up, and most feel that it is insufficient. And I'm just ask, just wondering that if you do feel it is sufficient, Minister. How did the department come to uh, that determination that two days was sufficient to begin with, and, and particularly in light of the growing protests from the profession? You know, w will you reconsider that? Well, I think I think we said about growing protests. I think we we tried to make yeah. where if there is concerns being raised about over administration, that, that that level of administration can then be rolled, rolled back on. Sure. Yeah, going to think. It was raised when we were talking to principals. We know we've engaged a lot um, with principal groups when we've been developing this process. And it was raised about the requirement, you know, if we could look for one or two days, um, the two days. And we're, you're trying to strike that balance as well all the time between, you know, giving that time. And then during this time that the schools will be closed to the pupils and young people as well. So you're trying to get that balance right. But that came from an, a request that was, can we have one or two days? To... So that was actually, I think, in response to what was raised by stakeholders directly within time, that. Yeah. And we've tried throughout this uh, on a Daniel you know, these things have not simply come from either CA or ourselves out of the ether uh, throughout both the trade union side and also stakeholder side of it with school principals. We've worked alongside those in the development of all of this. And therefore, yeah. when there's been issues raised, try to take account of that as well. 
Okay. Uh, the the centre specific guidance um, is not due to be with schools until the first of April, Minister. From from my understanding, it's very late, uh, as I'm Sorry. sure you've probably heard. The the the, the, the centre specific Daniel, it's it's out it's out already. Right. What when did that when was that released? The guidance issued on the 5th of March and then it was reissued again last week following the revisions after the discussions with trade union side and principal. So there was, well. yeah, initial guidance was issued on the 5th of March. Yeah. I, I think I think it may, it may be, Justin, we're maybe talking, sorry, uh, Daniel, we're talking maybe two separate things. So initial guidance was on the 5th of March, but then uh, following then further discussions with trade union side and stakeholders, there was then revised. But... I think that's the assessment tools, i.e. the things which then could be... Oh, yeah, that was the center, head of centre guidance. Then there has subsequently, they've started to issue subject level guidance. has started yeah. to go out already as well. Yeah, so that started to go out as well, yeah. No, okay, it, it started to go out. Uh, so... Uh, so went uh, out last uh, Friday, I think. Right. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Uh, and uh, Minister, considering the teachers are not paid for working in July and August, instead they're... <laughs> Uh, paid for 10 months, divided over 12 to ensure steady income, as we all know. Uh, will you undertake uh, to pay teachers and principals for the extra work they do in holiday time uh, and uh, thus grant, uh, grant uh, them equality with all other public, all other public service staff? Well, staff. With respect respect on it, the, the issue in terms of that is that, that uh, any sort of education staff are paid for the days that, that they are. They, they have a sort of a central contract in that regard. Um, where there is, for instance, additional work that would arise through, say, summer schemes on it, so on the basis then of additional pay that will be there. But I don't have a bottomless pit to be able to provide additional resources for um, for anything beyond that, really, on that on that basis. But anybody's doing work will get paid for for work. Okay. Yeah, it should have been asked by thanks, please. Of the July and from the ninth of August, and I'm just wondering, Minister, will they be paid for that extra work? So I didn't. I, I, uh, sorry, it was sorry my, my call, Minister Daniel, ask that final question, and I need to move on. Thanks. Go Just ahead, to the previous point, uh, Minister C has said that staff will need to be available until July fifth and from August 9th. and I'm just wondering, you know, uh, in think, terms I think, of. I think, I think that's. I think that's by way of being able to then contact. I don't think it's anything really beyond what would normally be the uh, the case, really. There on that on that basis. Uh, yeah. I think I think that I think particularly we're talking about the 9th of August, which tends to happen each year. I think that would be to enable then simply on the release of results. It's a slightly different time frame in terms of the re release results, which is happening everywhere on that on that basis on it. Yeah, but Minister, results are out earlier this week by almost a week, so therefore teachers are required to be available more earlier and prepared more earlier, and therefore more work. Uh, and I'm just wondering on that basis, will there be consideration from you as the Minister? Budget. Pay them Daniel, for that. Daniel, the budget, the budget is available, and that is not dissimilar in terms of ninth of August. Is what not dissimilar? What happens every year on that basis on it, and uh, you know the the pays are I, like I don't have additional available in the budget on that basis. Okay. Thanks, okay. Daniel. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, to very briefly to, to pick up on on Daniel's point in terms of mixed messaging around assessment. Um, you, obviously, you'd initially advise schools that there would be exams and to avoid over-assessing. Um, then, obviously, exams were cancelled. Um, we accept your point that you are advising schools that there is no compulsion to use SIA assessment resources, which are also referred to as repurposed examination instruments. But do you accept that um, guidance that has said assessment conducted under controlled conditions will be considered evidence of higher value will lead schools towards that type of assessment. No um, and well, this is a question, Minister. Uh, is are you monitoring the extent to which pupils are being controlled assessed? Well, no. I think we, from that point of view, I think there would be trusting the schools to actually to do that. The point, I suppose, is that if if First of all, uh, from the point of view of, of a level of assessment, if it's in a controlled environment, and I think that that's, again, largely speaking, what is happening elsewhere as well in connection with that in other jurisdictions to try to provide a robustness of, of uh, on that basis. But we have to give a level of trust that, that is there to schools to be able to do that. But, you know, if we've also said as part of this that in terms of, first of all, assessment, assessment tools are not compulsory 
they can schools can use them or not use them. And we've also not sought, in terms of the evidence that can be drawn down, can be drawn down from a range of sources. There's no particular weighting that is being put in place as, as regards that. But I think this is giving an opportunity for people to be able to demonstrate their particular skills within within that. Okay, need to bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA, thanks. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm sorry for ha having to kind of rush this. Um, thanks very much, Minister, and your team for attending here this afternoon. Um, I'll be very brief, but I'm due in the Chamber now shortly. Um, I just want to ask, first of all, um, Minister Weir, about Sure Start, and we mentioned it in your opening comments. Um, can you give me kind of any detail of when the Sure Start uh, programmes will, re will reopen? Um, this programme is targeted within areas of disadvantage and again, because it hasn't been able to reopen yet, I feel like the, those, most at, um, mo those most disadvantaged are being left behind again. I'm sure most of the Sure Start groups would agree that they are prepared to open and operate safely in line with health and education guidance. Um, you know, we all know that it's important that, uh, like, no one understands that we all want services and schools to reopen um, safely and only when it is safe to do so. Um, but I'm led to believe that in previous lockdowns, Sure Start programmes opened in line with nurseries and, and childcare sector. Um, so, can you just give me an update um, and outline maybe when Sure Start facilities okay. will be open? Please. Nicola, uh, look, I agree with the comments you've made in relation to Sure Start. Uh, we have put in, uh, put in, Right about the same time, there was a second, in addition to the paper that we had on restart in schools, there was a second paper, which is now slightly disaggregated, um, on youth restart and sure start that has not as yet uh, been discussed directly by the executive. And the format with that now is that everything is fed into the executive office task force, who will then seek the opinion of, of the Department of Health. Um, so it is with them. So we have submitted that. We want effectively that when a green light is given to Sure Start, that it can start immediately um, on the phase element of particularly where it impacts in on, on directly young children themselves uh, on that basis. So I want to see it happen immediately. It would be the executive would have to take a vision for it to be on the, the executive agenda. And do that. But look, I, you raise very valid points in terms of the fact of I think there's a very similar position as regards Sure Start compared with um, preschool, with childcare in terms of the age of the range of children, and also the fact that it impacts in on um, areas where there's, there's greater levels of deprivation. So I, I, we would be very much with you on that, that particular point. Well, that's great. I appreciate that, Minister, and um, hopefully we'll get, get them open soon. But I would also appreciate if that was communicated to the group so that they, uh, although hopefully they're ready to roll with them when we do get open, but that they also have the time to, to prepare if they need to. Um, I'm just going to have one final point, Minister, and that's about um, principals last year who faced like a huge burden because um, they essentially became track and tracers. So can you outline what engagement you have had with colleagues in the Department of Health and um, with the PHA in terms of providing more support, support sorry, to our schools and principals in particular, um, well, like regarding tracking and tracing? I know I, I understand that. Look, we, we, I think part of the part of the problem on it, Nicola, is that uh, in terms of tracing the individuals, I think a certain information can be given directly by schools. I think part of the problem is that when a child in particular has tested uh, positive, the people who are best able to assess, and there is a lot of work that's gone on with PHA, but it's very difficult to get around the equation that if child A has tested positive, the people who are in the best position to know um, who that child has been in direct contact with in the school environment is the school itself on that side of things. And I appreciate that does create a level of, of burden. And we work with PHA um, on that. don't know if there's any... You know, and I think that it's difficult to get around that, that particular issue, I think, on that basis, on it. Hopefully, yeah, I think one, of the, one, of, one of the issues, I think, at least, though, with the, hopefully, at least, in, with the, the lateral flow test is, because this is something done at home, where actually the identification before the child comes in, and we've done also during the Easter period, is that we stop um, children who are, who do have COVID coming in in the first place, and hopefully that should reduce the amount of in-school sort of um, connection and, and relationship. But no, I, I, I entirely understand the difficult position that it has left a lot of schools, a lot of school principals, but it's difficult 
to see any other route where there can be that identification other than through the school and through the principal itself. Okay, thank you for that, Minister. Again, maybe um, engagement with principals themselves, maybe they could have some ideas on how, like, what help or support they could use. But I appreciate that, and thanks very much for your time and for those answers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good luck in the Chamber, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Can I bring in Morris Bradley, MLA? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chair. Chair, I have, uh, just in case you can't hear me, because I'm, I'm struggling to hear the debate. I've sent you the, the questions I'm going to ask by text as well. I keyed them out. So I apologize for that. We can, we can hear you, Morris. We can hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me all right? Okay, yes, go ahead. Your, voice, your voice is coming over perfectly well. Your, your yeah, image right. is somewhat freezing a bit, but outside of that, the voice is, is fine. Well, that's not a bad thing, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Minister, the major part of school life, uh, as is drama, art, culture, and music. I'm sport man. Engage. What level of support exists uh, in the educational establishments to provide a three or four week summer scheme during July and August? And what progress has been made uh, to establish partnerships among local sports clubs and community groups to help provide any summer schemes that may come to fruition? That's the first one. Yeah, and they're in tax too. I think, Morris, I got, I got the gist of that. Look, I think um, it is important that as we look at recovery, we look at the uh, holistic solutions which involve both mental health and well-being, physical health, and also um, the academic side of it. I suppose the one barrier we have at the moment, I think part of this would, would have uh, then levels of linkages that can happen during the summer. I, I suppose it's difficult to know precisely how we can proceed in that until we get some level of greater certainty around the funding of that because I don't want to lead people into a position where it that we make arrangements for something to happen and then there isn't the finance for it, for it to happen. So it's, hopefully once we get that greater bit of clarity over the next week or two, that we should be able to start putting some of those in, in place. And I think um, I, I, I think there will be actually a, a high level of embracing from the wider community and particularly sporting organisations um, within that. Um. Minister, I struggle, struggle to pick that up, Minister. Uh, but, right. uh, I heard you mention finance, which brings me on to the next question. Uh, I feel that the approval funding will be to any summer program. Uh, Whoever you are, any uh, such schemes that may proceed. I, Minister, I think Morris was asking for about finance and funding for uh, ac extra activities. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, yeah. I think. Okay, Chair. I suppose really that, that is that is part of part of the overall bid in terms of COVID recovery money that we we put in uh, as part of that. Um, I think that hopefully we need to probably get a level of clarity on that fairly soon. That will be a decision taken partly by finance and also by the executive as a whole, but hopefully should be something one way or the other. Hopefully we'll get clarity within that fairly, fairty shortly. Okay. On that basis, have I got the gist of what, what Morris was saying? I, I, sorry, sorry, Chair. I forgot to press the end button around there. And... Okay. I think I'll have to do. Thank you. Thank, thanks, we'll Morris. Have to, we'll have, thanks, we'll Morris. have to get project, project Stratum up to the North Coast. Seems to be. I think he's at the assembly today. It's worse than the oh, North Coast. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Minister, um, just in the time we'll have left, uh, I think uh, Daniel had raised a hand to ask a, a supplementary with regards to the, the, the weighting that is being applied to the, the assessments. Daniel? Yes, uh, Chair. Uh, Minister, just to the point you raised, you said that there's no particular weighting in relation to the evidence, but on page 9 and page 38 of your own pack, there's definitions of the weighting, which falls under three categories, high, medium, and limited. And then under the evidence, there's a very clear uh, list of what is required, which is what's causing all this confusion. And Minister, it's very clear it's causing confusion because you didn't know it was even there. No, I didn't. No, I didn't say that. What I've said is that there's no specific formula that's being used in relation to that. Look, if you take a look, for instance, at what normally happens in terms of an A level, uh, normally if if COVID wasn't there, you'd have a situation where your AS results count as forty percent of that. 
the point is actually there's flexibility in terms of the way that schools can interpret this um, and as such it is not a question of you do a test it counts for 30 percent 40 percent 50 percent and that's what what is is meant by waiting in that in that regard Karen, I think maybe Karen wants to come in just... You see that the level of control one, and that is really around the certainty of it being a candidate's own work. I think that section and that's what that comes in. But I think the guidance is also you know, very explicit in saying that SEER understands that in the circumstances, centres are going to need to use evidence generated with more limited levels of control. That's explicitly in there. And they've also been explicit in saying that work completed at home can contribute to the evidence. You know, so, I mean, the... There is, as I say, a, a wide range, and it can be, you know, drawn from lots of different things. So it can be coursework, controlled assessment, mock exams, practice questions, or essays. You know, that's all laid out as well. Mm -hmm. But it does recognise. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate, appreciate that. Kind of, the, the, like the, the difficulty is that principals are saying to me, you know, if I award a grade, Daniel. Uh, and I am subject then to an appeal. What evidence do I need in that appeal to substantiate what we have awarded? Yeah. And, that, that, and that's where the grey area is, Minister, because we don't know what the criteria is for the appeals mechanism yet or what it's going to look like or anything else. So principals, with respect, with respect the principals are uh, quite concerned and therefore are leaving uh, no room for ambiguity and feel that the only option they have is for assessments, which would be probably, on your own scale, the strongest possible evidential base. Yeah, they are. But I think the important thing for schools to know is there is a piece in there as well. Is it about a, there's a template for a policy to set out what is being what is going to be used and how they're going to run that process within the school. And that's the key document for them, really, because they need to be very open and transparent and clear with pupils and the parents about how the process is going to run in their school and i imagine that if there is any appeal that will be the first thing were you explicit and clear about how this is going to run and is that what you applied so that actual policy which doesn't have to be a long document but just very clear of how it's going to operate i think that's okay the yeah, I think what would help, though, in the mix of all this uncertainty and confusion is clarification around the appeal mechanism. You see, it, you see it should produce that now, so ministers or principals but, know where they stand. Yeah. Well, minister, minister, just to supplement that and to, to move us on, my understanding is that the appeals process is a decision for yourself, so can we ask when you will have the appeals process in place to help with it, some it of should, the issues? It should be fairly soon yeah. in that regard. We want to make sure that any appeals process is, is pretty much in line with what's happening elsewhere as well so that there can be a relatively consistent approach because we don't want to create a situation where, again, say at a university, there is a suspicion because somebody has gone through a particular exam board that one is either a harder or easier path than, than that, but we should be able to produce that fairly soon. Okay. Minister, a, a brief further question from myself. We're, we're on time. Yeah, I think right. that's about for you here. Um, the, look, the post-primary transfer was raised earlier, and, and like Pat, I, I genuinely try and avoid a, a debate on post-primary transfer itself. I think what we can agree on, hopefully, is that COVID has prevented academic selection this year and in the absence of a coherent contingency the post-primary transfer process for many children and families has been chaotic and distressing so is work underway with regard to a contingency plan for post-primary transfer for the for next year's cohort uh, should it be necessary look we'll be happy i think to work with whoever, whether it's the schools, whether it's the transfer organisations themselves. The problem is, and I've, I've consistently made this point, I, I'm not, I don't want to get into an argument over this, but the problem is, I suppose, in terms of contingency, to have a scenario in which you take, if academic selection goes off the table, then the problem is that you're left with a range of other criteria, which do mean that it's not necessarily fair to to others, and there is a difficult way to get round any of that. To be perfectly honest, on on that side of a chair. Okay, um, I, Pat has raised the hand to come in as well, and then I just like to ask a, a, a final question, Pat. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks again, Minister, for uh, your presence here today. I, I want to go off piste a bit. Uh, if you don't want to answer the question, fair enough, uh, because it's not connected to. Today's issue. If we're in area planning, uh, Minister, 
And uh, I know you met my uh, colleague Gemma Dolan last week around a school in Fermanagh. Yeah. And it, it, it's, there's, there's a wider issue involved here in terms of remote rural schools. And you know in this particular school, St Mary's and Brola, that if it closes, pupils will have to travel more than 25 miles to attend school in, in a skilling. And, and I, I, I accept fully the need for area planning and, and that rationalisation of the estate. However, one size doesn't fit all, as you know, and in some cases, exceptions have to be made and these decisions need to be rural-proofed and so on. And I suppose what I'm asking you, do you agree with what I'm only after saying? And I suppose a, a, a follow-up, is there a case to be made in regard to St Mary's or well, has your decision well, final? No, look, uh, I, I suppose I make, make uh, a couple of points. Technically speaking, once a development proposal has been taken, the only way that that can then be changed outside of, theoretically, I suppose maybe, you know, you'd always get a court judicially reviewing or whatever. But outside of that, once a decision has been taken of whatever nature in a DP, the only way that that can then be reversed is with another development proposal, which would have to come through the managing authority, in this case through CCMS. Rurality is taken into account. All matters are taken into account um, with regard to that, which is why if you take for a to take one example on it, uh, Pat, if you take the issue on primary schools, for instance, what is regarded as being sustainable for a primary school will differ on a different figure between a, a rural setting and an urban setting. But the position in terms of St Mary Ball, and I know there was a lot of really good work being done, I suppose just on a couple of specific points, and a very constructive meeting with Gemma and Michelle Gildernew um, in relation to it. We are in a position in terms of St Mary's Brawler where, first of all, Many of the pupils going to St Mary's Brawler were on a weekly basis already having to do the, the route up to Enniskill and others because the school itself, I think the figures roughly speaking, I'm quoting a little bit off the top of my head, had reached the point at which the numbers attending the school were, I think it was either 67 or 70 off the top of my head, when actually the, the threshold that is normally assumed for sustainability of a school, a post-primary school, is 500 with an intake of 100. So it is a little bit over 10% of, of what is regarded as being sustainable. It is the situation that the school, in terms of entitlement framework, because it was so small in that nature, was having to rely on a number of other schools to be able, and the likes of the college, to provide um, the level of choice. So there was a, an education issue because those at that at that level was not able to provide the, the width of, of choice for schools and also the fact that from a financial sustainability point of view it was 1.8 million pounds in deficit on that regard uh, look I, I entirely understand that any closure of any school is a very difficult situation but whenever the numbers attending a school in a post-primary setting are below those that are regarded even in a rural setting as what should be the figures as a minimum figure uh, for even a primary school, uh, it is difficult to do. I, I have, look every sympathy, and I appreciate yeah. that any yeah. any closure will have a level of impact in in, in yeah. connection. Yeah. And rurality will be will be yeah. taken into account. And but it, the, sometimes there are certain decisions reach a point where just it is simply not not sustainable. Yeah. Not, I, not appreciate, I appreciate you you taking that question, Peter. Yeah. And I suppose one of the difficulties in situations like this is where. Yeah. Uncertainty is created around the school, then that in itself affects the enrolment numbers because people get the get get the view that the school isn't going to survive, that it's not going to be sustainable. Move away before all of that happens. Pat, I think I think Pat, look, that's a a reasonable point, and that is I think that's tended to be the case. I've seen this happen in different schools at times when a school sometimes is is. Even before a proposal is brought forward, if it if it, if it falls into a, a general issue of it is being examined under area planning as regards to sustainability, yes, there there does tend to be a bit of a, a walking away. But I, I would say that even if you go back a few years in terms of the, the level of, of intake, it is a long, long way below what we would normally consider as a sustainable school on that regard. I have to take every decision on its on its own merits. And look, I can entirely appreciate 
the frustration and disappointment for anybody who's at St Mary's Ball, as would be the case, I think, with almost any in any closure. And I can understand the level of attachment that is there going to be there at a particular school. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks, Minister. Minister, in our at our meeting tomorrow, we are engaging on the issue of the General Teaching Council. Um, yeah. We we've received serious concerns with regards to the dysfunctionality of the the General Teaching Council. Um, do, do you have concerns about uh, the dysfunctionality of the General Teaching Council and? Is there any risk uh, to the regulation of misconduct in particular at this moment in time? Well, look, um, Chair, I'll have to be just a little bit careful of what I say. Yes, I would share concerns over dysfunctionality. As such, therefore, uh, I've instituted a new uh, that will should report, I think, by June of this year into the um, sort of governance and... Um, suitability of aspects of, say, of, of that. I suppose I just got to be careful directly what I say beyond that just at this moment, because I, I don't want to be accused then if that um, is sort of externally being looked at with a relatively quick turnaround, that I don't say something which is then seen to be prejudicial to the outcome of that. But I wouldn't have um, instituted that review if I didn't share um, concerns over dysfunctionality, the question mark over dysfunctionality of, of GTC. Okay, but I, look, I think I think there'll be a more more extensive, I think, opportunity enough. to go into that tomorrow. Fair enough. To, to what final final question? To, to what extent does the delay of of Department of Education legislation um, to enhance the functionality of the General Teaching Council contribute to those problems? I think, I think to speculate the problems. I think uh, it is. Less to do probably with the legislation, more to do with, I think, certain other factors in that regard. But okay. obviously, the review is, is, is taking place and connected. And I think, obviously, the committee okay. has an opportunity to go into that. I, okay. I think I think it also, I suppose, as regards legislation, because as, as you're obviously aware, legislation is not something which can happen overnight. And no. I suppose one of the things as well is, depending upon what the review says, I think there'll be critical questions then will we'll need arising out of that as to what actions okay. can get taken okay. if things are not able to be simply rectified by way of, of um, okay. legislation immediately. Minister, as I say, goodbye for now. Um, flexible school starting age legislation, will we be able to, will you be able to get that through in this mandate? Uh, look, I would sincerely hope so. I think what we're working on is getting the policy context right. There's a lot of uh, work within that. And I know, to be fair, it's something that um, that you would share, other committee members would, would share. I think, to be fair, you know, there may be at times slight degrees of disagreement about where precisely we land, but I think the general principle is one that I think that all of us are committed to. And as such, I think uh, that once we get the policy and the consultation out on that, I want to see this move ahead as quickly as, as, as possible in relation to that. I think you're right. I think there is consensus on enough could be found and the committee would cooperate with you effectively and efficiently to ensure that we, we could get that passed. I think that would be a positive achievement for you before the end of the mandate, so we, we would work with you on that. Minister, thanks very much indeed for your, thank, your time thank you. today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, members. Now, if I could ask the clerk to summarise any actions uh, following from the briefing today. Um. Chair, the only action I have really is to follow up on the questions that were inaudible from Morris, um, but I'm happy for members to um, suggest other actions they would like in, in follow up. Okay, yeah, that, that would be good to submit uh, Morris's question with regards to a um, wide range of activities for children and young people in the form of a, a summer programme, say in cooperation between schools and community groups. I think it would be good to get a bit more detail from the Minister in that regard. Any other members wish to raise follow-up actions? There is a hand card as well coming of the okay. uh, session. Okay. Members, sure. can, uh, sorry, Robin, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sure, I, would, I would be tempted, uh, uh, I wouldn't push it, but I would be tempted to um, write to the Minister on the flexible school starting age um, 
as, maybe as well both encouragement uh, to the minister and encouragement to those who have been lobbying on, on the issue. Because I think the, the response from the minister there was uh, quite, quite encouraging. Yeah. Thanks for that, Robin. Yeah, I would second that. Um, I, I, I genuinely think this is an issue that we can get consensus on in order to get it through before the mandate. And there are uh, there are families out there who really want that flexible yeah. starting age to be applicable in the in the coming years. So um, agreed. I that, Robin. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I, I, I would certainly concur with that. Uh, I'm just wondering on another issue. Would it would it be possible to, to write to the department and ask them for some uh, further information on what bids they're making in in, in regard to the particularly the emotional and well being issues that we're going to be facing? Happy to agree that. Okay. Kurt, could could we also ask for um, an update in writing with regards to when? Further engage funding, engage program funding will be allocated and released to schools. That was something that Robin had raised as well. Um, and, and perhaps any update with regards to contingency planning for post primary transfer next year. Uh, would members be content for us also to ask the minister when? Um, his next available date to attend the committee would be if we get in there at an early, an early advance uh, notice. Um, I think a number of the issues that were raised today are going to remain very live in the coming weeks. Um, so, Clark, if we could, if we could get the next available date for the minister to attend committee in order to um, program our own forward work program accordingly. Agree. Agreed. Members, I, as, I had, as I had mentioned previously, I'll, I'll endeavour to, to work on draft motions in relation to restraint and uh, seclusion. Um, I'm conscious also that we're scheduled to take briefings on relationship and sexuality education as well um, as some of the, of the, the key up, upcoming issues. But important meeting tomorrow in relation to general teaching council issues and from SIA uh, for a bit more detail on that live assessment issue for many pupils uh, across Northern Ireland as well. Members content to agree those actions for the clerk, yeah? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Any other business members? No. Okay, then our, our next formal committee meeting is scheduled for tomorrow via starting at 9.30 a.m. The committee meeting does now adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.